Is it a group based on black empowerment or the exploitation of children? A&E investigates the United Nation of Islam. My parents, they wanted the best for their children. They were naive. They just really put their trust into something that they thought was a religion, which turned out to be a monster. Do you have any idea how many kids were trafficked by this group? Their primary activity is structured around the labor of young children. It was slavery. That's exactly what it was. How could you send me off this as an eight-year-old? You know, like, I can protect myself. We've never really had the opportunity to come forward to bring every single person that's responsible for these children being abused to justice. I was born in Cincinnati, Ohio. Growing up, it was me, my parents, and my two siblings. Carl, he's the oldest, and then Mary. Mary's the baby girl. My parents, they wanted their children to be around the African-American mindset of entrepreneurs. They were in the Nation of Islam. The Nation of Islam didn't work out for them. So when they see Royal Jenkins in the United Nation of Islam, that's what they went for. For Royal Jenkins, Louis Farrakhan's movement of the Nation of Islam was a failure. African Americans, in his estimation, have not gotten their fair share of the American pie, that is, a community and land of their own. He sees himself as a viable alternative who can bring these realities into being. So Royal Jenkins started the United Nation of Islam. You know, I know we've talked about this before, but we shouldn't confuse this group with the controversial Nation of Islam, right? That would be correct, John. The United Nation of Islam has a well-documented track record of reviving blighted areas and restoring hope. Royal preached that he would be the one to help minorities rise up from oppression, and we believed him. We want this planet back. Whether any white people, black people, or any people come at all, we got to get this planet back. And it's already started back. We've already started it back on this journey. I guess the main thing that was interesting to my parents was the fact that in a low-income area, they produced businesses. And there was young African-American people who were doing something different besides getting in trouble. It was the opportunity for them to do something positive with their lives. So my parents started to participate, and my dad actually became the first minister of the study class in Cincinnati. Me and my two siblings attended the academy, which is the local school for the organization. The first thing that they told us was that Royal Allah in person is the creator of everything. He is God. Royal Jenkins preached that he had been taken on a tour around the universe by scientists. They gave me a little knowledge of everything in the universe, and even taking me into the sun. Most people think, you know, they made a joke of that and everything, but it literally took place. The United Nations of Islam, they mythologized uh, sort of a history of black people that did not originate with slavery, but has a prehistory on other planets. So I think Royal's experience that he claims with the angel scientists casts him as, as Allah on this earth, and it gives him a certain religious authority. Elijah Muhammad, you were a member as a child of the United Nation of Islam. Why Royal Jenkins? 
Why did people follow him? When a person comes from the same background as they're following, the people tend to relate to them. You know, sure. when you, when you have like a person, me. yeah, when you have a person that say, well, here's a person in the cold, I'm willing to take my coat off and give it to him, and he does it. Everyone that's used to being more selfish, so to speak, mm -hmm. look at him and say, wow. Absolutely. These are things that make a person say, I'm going to give my last dime to see that this goes as far as it can. It's clear to see why it might appeal to some people who have been treated as the bottom of the culture, people who have very few opportunities, mm -hmm. whose life possibilities seem fixed and limited. Mm. Right? And here comes this organization that says you can be more than that. In fact, you are more than that. You're gods. Well, and let's be honest here. This was Royal Jenkins and United Nation of Islam came into being at a time when there wasn't a lot of other people willing to invest in these communities. Sure, and correct. That's exactly these right. were the ignored, neglected, mm -hmm neighborhoods That's that right. nobody wanted to go near. That's Absolutely. Right. And here was somebody saying, uh-uh, I believe in you, here's some money, right. mm -hmm. you can do better, we can do better. That's right. It's powerful. Mm -hmm. The United Nation of Islam is trying to bring hope back by doing right on Quindaro. Not to be confused with Farrakhan's group, the United Nation is about making a positive change. When I was 12 years old, my parents received a phone call from Royal's first wife. We were informed that my brother and I were ready to take our next step into manhood. And what that meant was we were to go to the community of the United Nations of Islam. The community is known as heaven. You know, if you got a bunch of negative things happening in the community, drugs, gang banging, violence, and then you have a place that claims to be opposite of it, of course you want your children to participate in something better than what they're used to. And so, Bags were packed that night. We were told transportation will be here tomorrow to get you. And so when tomorrow came, it was very scary. We didn't know who we were staying with. We didn't know who it was that was transporting us. It was a semi-truck. It read on the side, the United Nations of Islam. And we rode them back to be transported to, uh, to heaven. When the truck pulled up, me and my brother got off. The first thing they told us was, this is the FY barracks. So leaving your parents' house and transitioning into barracks, it's a place where soldiers reside. So we're no longer children. We're expected to be soldiers. We're expected to be men. And that meant anything that came along with that, you had to endure it. You know, being young is one thing, but being young and dumb and rebellious is another that is not tolerated. Now, in our attempt to make sure that you develop properly, sometimes you make us bring out unpleasantries. We put our trust into something that we thought was a religion, which turned out to be a monster. What does a person that was watching this program, what do they have to, the first steps they have to make to start the process of seeing a lot? Because they're not going to see it just by looking at your physical person. True. Like I have known many people that has been that has been with me and that is still are. They change their looks, they change their thinking, they change their bank account because of the discipline that they learn of what truth produces. So let's talk a little bit about your trip to heaven. Maybe it's because I'm a mom of two boys about the same age as you and your brother were when you were sent there, but that really got to me watching mm -hmm. you talk about that mm -hmm. and how scary and hard that must have been. Um, how hard was it to leave home? Oh, very, very hard, very hard. Although we were told this is family, I didn't know the people, mm -hmm. you know. And actually, a young boy, he misses his mom and his father. And uh, for me, it was, it was hard. You were homesick? Oh, yeah. So 
When we arrived to the place where we lived, I was 12 years old. It was about 14 individuals who lived in this apartment. We really didn't have a chance to breathe. It was constant, constant motion. School. Then after school, duty, work. I was a dishwasher. After work, I went to worship. Then after worship, you go back to the dishwasher. Finish up, go home, three in the morning. Then wake up at five, do it all over again. That was my daily routine at 12 years old. It was better that my brother was there with me. Life in heaven was strange. We were all compacted in this small community in Kansas. I was 15 years old, and we had school at the university where we pretty much was just reminded over and over and over again about what our purpose was on the planet which was to learn everything from Royal and then go out and teach the world how to be civilized and how to be like God. You know, when you have a child, more than one, and one is very obedient and uh, it does what it's supposed to do, yes. very respectful, uh, you can't do enough for that child. Then you have another child, his brother or a sister, and they're just the opposite. So that's where the power is to be shown on the one that's acting obstinate. The studies for the University of Islam is rooted in their book that orientates you to the philosophies of the nation, which was called the Book of Introduction. They would touch on things like math, reading, language. Royal taught that language was something that lays with you, and so they teach you how to speak a certain way and use words that mean something different. There were certain words that was forbidden, like the word hello. It was not getting on the phone saying hello. It was yes or to whom am I speaking. It was not hello. Royal taught that this subliminally sentences the receiver to the lowest part of hell. This is what they do. They control how you speak. If you was found saying any one of these, oh, you, you were definitely in trouble you will be at the Mike and math class, <laughs> definitely. What is math class? Math class is not the normal math class. The class consisted of different people who did bad things that day. So if you were scolded for something, you were brought to the Mike and math class and publicly humiliated. If they found that you were walking the wrong way down the street, you were a scenario that night. Well, you were brought in front of the people and you were humiliated. Disciplinary action is what is next. A person that was in a scenario or an infraction in the nation, the entire auditorium of people would come to the mic and punch the person in the chest. That was what was referred to as a chest cap. You would hear the wind being knocked out of the person. But to see a person who's a part of the nation get physically hit, it was shocking. So it was, yeah, it was very militant. That's what they called everybody, military, and we were the soldiers. And if you got an order, you don't question your order, you just carry it out. When you understand the, 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 the propaganda that was taught and you understand why it was taught that way, you start to believe it. And so, yes, we were the biggest supporters of it. What is the communication like with home at that We really didn't communicate much back home. When we would speak, an official would monitor phone calls. 
So we really wouldn't, they didn't reach out to us much and we weren't calling them, you know? What was the promise given to your parents? What will we do with your kids at heaven? The promise that they gave was pretty much that we had the opportunity to guarantee our salvation. And it wasn't just businesses in heaven, because a lot of these kids were brought to heaven and trained, indoctrinated, mm -hmm. and then sent to other United Nations of Islam businesses throughout the country. Correct. They call it dispatched. Dispatched? Correct. They would have conferences, and it would literally be like an NFL draft. Really? Oh, yeah. You know, if, if you made a, a, a record for being good at what you were doing, and you didn't cause problems, you were sent to the newest place that was opening. So if it was New York, they told you, hey, you going to New York? We need you packed tonight. Could you leave in an hour? Really? That little notice? Yeah. yeah. Were, you, were you separated from your brother? Were you no. sent to different places? Yes. I remained in heaven or in Kansas City, Kansas, and Carl was sent to the East, Eastern Shore Maryland farm. Mm -hmm. And then I was sent to New Jersey. New, New Jersey was the first place I was dispatched to. And did they inform your parents you were being moved to another state? No. Wait, so your parents said goodbye to you in Ohio and knew you were going to heaven, and after that, they had no idea? Correct. They wouldn't hear about me or my siblings being in a different place until someone who may have seen us in that city went through Cincinnati and told them. It became something that you got used to. You know, for me, I saw it as something to keep you in, on the right track. So you were all sort of brainwashed into thinking, this is normal? Yes. You got hundreds of youth who worked, sometimes day and night, in the restaurants, the businesses, mm -hmm. supermarkets. We would go to school, then go straight to work. Mm -hmm. And we never received any pay. And now that I'm an adult, I realized what that was. You know, it was literally under the disguise of building a nation, it was human trafficking. You know, we were moved across. Oh, man. You all right? Mm, yeah. The nation has about six or seven restaurants around the country. The organization is utilizing the labor of children they are not paying any of these children. And the majority of the time, the children who are being moved from state to state to work in these restaurants, their parents are not with them. It's not their parents moving them state to state. So yes, it's definitely human trafficking. And I want to expose the United Nations of Islam to the FBI to prevent other kids from going through what myself, friends, and my family went through. I actually got a phone call recently from one of the FBI agents in Kansas City, Kansas, and he wants to talk to me about some of the things that happened, so it's a big, major thing going on. I want to ask the FBI agents, you know, simple questions that anybody can ask. Do you know that children are working and they're not being paid? Do you know that they're not getting breaks? Do you know that there are minors working? I want to address the physical and mental abuse and the young people who died. I'm going to meet my friends that grew up in the nation. They have specifics and input that's crucial. And we're going to talk about this, figure out what's the best way to build a case against them.
to help build my case for the FBI against the United Nations of Islam, I'm going to meet my best friends, Naisha King, Caleb Butler, and his sister, Ayana, and their father, Derek Butler. They have different time frames of things that have happened in the nation that's uh, impactful. And I think by us all coming to the table and bringing these different things together, we'll be able to paint a bigger picture of what exactly happened and why we need to stop it. When I joined the organization, I had donated much time, much energy, and resources to the development and the maintenance of the United Nation of Islam. Among those resources were my 11 children, including Caleb and Ayana. They had been uh, offered so that they could be developed in a way that would be a benefit to all of us, including themselves. And so that must weigh heavily on everything that happened because when they boil it down, they think, my parents put me in this. And, and it's true. This morning, I woke up and realized today's my dad's birthday. Oh. Yeah. Oh, he is a Capricorn. That's a shame. Yeah. You can't even call him and tell him happy birthday because he won't accept that That's from it. you. That's it, yep. It's really sad. Yep, and then after I thought about that, I realized everyone at the table is going to be affected by exposing yourself, your vulnerability, and things that you've been through. Mm -hmm. Those times when you all were in the nation, you'll never forget them. Yeah. You'll never forget them. Hearing that is why I wanted to make sure that I did something. What a federal agent reached out to me he just wanted to know uh, some of the things that's going on. And I just wanted to know from you guys if you had anything that you wanted to make sure that I shared or brought up and uh, to make sure I don't leave anything out. My thing is, the, the main thing about, <laughs> I can't imagine participating still after a realization of something or an institution that derives on taking advantage of people, young and old. That's the most cowardly act. I think anybody could ever commit to take advantage of children and the elders. And that's exactly what they're doing. Listen, I personally witnessed children working un underage when they shouldn't have been. Yeah. I remember um, when I came to Kansas, I did not go to school. I was shipped downstairs into a basement where I worked with um, two elderly people who trained me in the ways of making products for the nation's businesses. It's not like we would be experiencing the benefits of the business, like, oh, this is where you can go to wash your laundry. No, you'll be working here and washing other people's laundry when they come. It was just all, it was all, a, it was all a lie. And I stayed in that lab for the next four years. But yeah, they still currently have children doing that now, what we were doing then. Um, I was sent off to Kansas when I was eight. <sighs> I was born in the cult, so. My dad was already in it when he had me. And as a child, being separated from your family members, you go to a place you don't know anybody, you're staying with strangers, you're being told what to do 24 seven. You're being abused, you're not being fed, you're being having to work in sewing factories, in supermarkets, in other places where no child should have to do that, period. Fear and isolation were their favorite tactics to use against us. The whole concept of the nation just blows my mind on how could parents send their children off? Like, how could you send me off, Dad? Like, I know you only knew so much, but it's like, as an eight-year-old, I'm not 16, I'm not 18, so like, I can speak for myself, do for myself, but it's kind of like, I don't understand, like, how could the parents not realize something's wrong with their kids? And allow people to just do these horrible things to us. I have to accept the blame where the blame falls. You know, if my daughter was sitting there saying, why didn't somebody come and get me out of this? And I'm not shrewd enough to figure out, you know, that she's calling for help. But, and I think if, if it happened to me, then it happened to every parent who dispatched their children somewhere where we couldn't see what was going on. So those kind of things that occurred you know, it's like putting a nail in somebody's hand. You can take it out. There's still going to be a hole in there for the rest of their life. You know, I'm sorry that hole's in there. That's my fault. 
But that's why it's so important to get in touch with the parents or the children who are currently there now. Absolutely. So that it doesn't, if I can't heal the wound in her hand, at least I can prevent the wound from getting in someone else's hand. Mm -hmm. That's why it's important, you know, because it breaks that cycle. You know, so this, this cycle should stop. It should stop. It's only going to stop if people stop it. about Food for Life Supreme is that its value stretches far beyond what's on its menu. The restaurant serves as a classroom to local children aspiring toward careers in culinary arts. You know, that, that particular Food for Life location has a lot of significance. My memories of being there, I had a bad experience when I was there. Uh, when I was there, I was there on disciplinary. They had me on uh, bean soup and salad where I couldn't eat any other food but just beans and salad. And uh, I don't know, it's just a horrible experience. I don't have, to, have too many good memories about it. The thing about working for Food for Life Supreme is that Royal liked to put forth the image of health and wellness being the main thing that he promotes, when in reality, he punished the followers by putting them on restrictive diets and week-long fasts. Fasting was like a main disciplinary action. Royal taught that when you take a person's meals away, they can't really focus on what it is that's going on around them enough to make a, a logical decision. They were doing this to kids and adults. They were not receiving the nutrition that they needed or the medical attention that they needed. There it is. Same color scheme. When the towel and everything was put in, you were here for all of that. Yeah, I was here for all of that, yeah. When I moved here, this was the place where I started to speak up and say, hey, this is wrong. Right. Y'all doing the wrong thing. You all are abusing the members. And I remember Shaquante worked in here. Yeah. This is the last, this is the last restaurant she was in. I'll never forget that. My wife had a sister. Her name was Shaquante Williams. I don't know what happened. We didn't even get to see her. There was no funeral. Only a few people said they seen her. And when they seen her, she was extremely ill to the point that her eyes were protruding out her head. We didn't even know she was sick. She was either 14 or 15. Shaquante was a young girl when she passed. When Shaquante was sick and all that was happening in here, mm -hmm. that was telling her to still go, to, go work. to work in this place that she was faking. It got to the point where she had to sit down. You know, like, they had her working while sitting because she couldn't walk. They sent her back to Kansas. They called it the Community House of Wellness. The United Nations of Islam had their own medical facility. They do not believe in Western medicine. The biggest thing that was we always tried to avoid was going to the hospital. If you're following with royal talk, you won't have no real health situations. He taught that everybody would live forever. He's gonna change death. Shaquante begged to go to the hospital, and they did not take her. None of them were qualified to treat what was going on with her. She should have been immediately taken to the hospital, and it did not happen. They treated Chiquante with three baths of Epsom salt, you know, blended food, music therapy, and it got to the point where her entire immune system shut down. And the story that Royal gives is that she wills herself into extreme illness, and she, by self-conflict, passes.
pretty much. She died in agony, in pain, and we were lied to about it. My wife was just uh, very brokenhearted behind that. She was, uh, you know, she just wasn't the same. She was very quiet. She didn't talk. Anybody that know her, she was very playful. And after that, she she wasn't like that anymore. She was very, uh, she was just sad all the time. You know, everything I ever cared about, you know, just, just fell through my hands. There was nothing I could do to, to stop it from happening. These are children, and if we don't do something to help them to escape it. We're cowering to something that's, that can be easily defeated. We can bring the people responsible to some type of justice. I truly believe that. When I saw Shaquante last, she was healthy. And the next time I had seen Shaquante, she was ashes. And we were told that that's what she wanted. She wanted to be with her creator. Because passing was not something that we believed in, especially a young person, when it happened, we were like, wow, like no one told us. But Yanya, you've seen this in other cults where when they say you're gonna live forever or Armageddon is gonna happen on this day at this time and then the time and date passes right. and nothing happens or somebody tragically dies, how do they readjust and keep the faith going? Right, well typically the, the leader will reframe the event, like saying, you know, she had to go to Allah so she could be with her husband. Or she willed or herself. Or she willed herself, right. yeah, it'll get reframed. When you tell people for over 20 something years that they'll live forever, when people start dying, I, a, a lot of people within their right mind will wonder, what's going on with this? You know, And that's what ended up happening. A lot of people did wonder that. He knew that he lost control of the nation, and if the members kept talking, there goes the entire congregation. And so that's why, at this time, communication between different states, they said no one was to talk. A 90-day cleanse was ordered after Shaquante's death. What was that about? What was that supposed to accomplish? We were supposed to be introduced into a new expression of, of godhood. And during this time, intense study into Royal's original philosophy. They were worried that Shaquante's death had shaken yeah. so many of you. Certainly. And Absolutely. Certainly. We need to make sure, Absolutely. okay, no, 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 no. This is what we believe, no talking. That's a mm -hmm. perfect example mm -hmm. of the Extra, kind of yeah. control that'll happen to silence everybody. This like, oh, let's have a new campaign and let's have everybody rededicate and yep. recommit and nobody's gonna have a moment to think about this girl that just died and a horrible death. Correct. Right, so it's very deliberate, very calculated. But why don't people lose the faith? Why don't people start going, wait a second? Well, some people might, but in general, people won't because they're used to following that person and they're used to trusting and believing in that person. Mm. So in an organization like this, you, you, you know, your only loyalty is to the leader. I went and I listened to the conference, and he's telling everyone this is what happened. A girl died, but hey, my daughter also died three times. And she died, and we have uh, began the process of making her into someone new. You know, to have your child literally die three times. However, the scientists told us before it happened, that's gonna happen, don't worry, we got it. 
we were told Royal's daughter was hosting the 24 scientists that took Royal across the universe and gave him a little knowledge of everything. Royal said she was a vessel to help people communicate to them. He wanted to take the attention off the deaths and put it on something else. And that story that he made up about his daughter was the perfect ploy to do it. That was it. I had enough after that. Before, we had to call the police, and we didn't have enough people to come forward and say anything. But now we have the opportunity to really use the, the truth as a glove, as a punching glove. We're going to do our best to get the best blow that we can with it. agent wants to meet us a little bit earlier. 100 thoughts running through my mind right now. I just want to make sure I'm spiritually prepared for what's about to happen. I'm a little nervous, because he got me off my, my, my A game like I planned, but the unexpected makes the adventure a little more exciting to me anyway, so it's not a problem. All right, we ready to rock and roll. Good old KC weather for you. I'm feeling very excited about the FBI meeting, because we get to finally get our story out to the authorities. We've never really had the opportunity to come forward to talk to the, any law authority about what's going on. But now, since they want to know what happened to us, it gives us a chance to really go over it thoroughly the way it should be done. Specifics, you know, events, things that happened to people who died. The agent said it'll be there at 11 o'clock. I'm gonna talk about some of the deaths that occurred. Yeah. The beatings, everything. One of the main things I want to address is human trafficking and the free labor. Today, they still are utilizing minors to make their money, and uh, that is something that we need to address ASAP. Man, wish me luck. Already. Everyone believes uh, whatever they was told, but it's a select few of us who really know what happened. And it's many others who died or lost their parents. And the truth about it never came out. And uh, I'm hoping that, uh, the, the agents, that they are the Superman that we've been waiting on to help. So when you went to go meet with the FBI in that hotel room, mm -hmm. were you nervous? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Were you afraid they would be like, come on, this, this can't possibly be happening in the United States of America in yes. full view of everybody? Yes. And some people had asked me, like, do you get nervous talking to the feds? I'm <laughs> like, listen, if you saw what I saw, right. you would run to talk to the yes. FBI. <laughs> What's Not next really. on this? Like, do, will they tell you if they, are they going to go out and now and try and verify the story? Um, I'm pretty sure they're going to go out and uh, start the process of verifying the story. There's actually a lawsuit now. A woman, a former member of the United Nation of Islam, is suing the organization and corroborating a lot of what you've been saying all along. Yes, correct. Her name is Kendra Ross. She placed a lawsuit against the organization for human trafficking.
And so that kind of helped to validate what I was saying. And I'm pretty sure that I uh, put some, a little bit of fuel in the FBI's tank to go after these individuals. Do you think that your, your going to authorities will lead to more people inside United Nations of Islam speaking out either publicly or to authorities? I hope so. Because everyone wants to pretend like it didn't happen. You know, they're embarrassed, they don't want to talk about it. And I just want to show them that at this point, there's nothing to lose. There's so much to gain, so much. And uh, I have hopes that they do come forward. I really do. Especially the ones who are inside because that's the biggest challenge, being able to have someone come forward that's already there and say something. What's justice for you? Justice for, for me would be everyone who was involved with Shaquante's death being uh, held responsible. You know, human trafficking is wrong, but when it gets to the point where people are dying and it's swept under the rug, in a terrible, cruel way. Oh, yeah, painful. That painful girl death. got no love mm -hmm. and no comfort. That would be true justice for me, everyone involved, to be brought to justice for it. Well, let's hope you get your justice. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. It's a good first step. <laughs> this is the starting point of bringing the nation down by exposing the organization as a call. We threw such a blow to their recruiting system, and that is big to me, because now I know that I did my best to enlighten others on exactly who they are and why they should not get involved with them. If I can go to sleep knowing that I did that, I'm fine with that. This is the start of healing, I feel.